Good evening, everyone. I, uh, I'm Katie Benvenuto. I'm Columbia College class of 2003 and a very proud alumna of the women's basketball program. And I am here to introduce our event tonight. I am I'm really, I'm really, really thrilled to be here with these women in this virtual room. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about it, uh, about these women in a second. Uh, but first, just to, to frame this a little bit, uh, Columbia Athletics is really excited to continue de to demonstrate its commitment to diversity, racial equity, justice, and inclusion with, uh, with a series of programs. This marks the second in the social conversation series. There'll be more to come. Um, and, the, and for this one, we're really here to celebrate the role of women, both in athletics and in, in professional spheres. And I have to say, just to, just to tease the event a little bit, um, the women you'll hear from tonight um, are really um, exceptional trailblazers. And I think people who um, define the idea that um, there is no prescribed path and that uh, bravery and the willingness to adapt to different circumstances really is a is a skill that I would say we we learn as athletes and then we can carry forward into our professional lives in a pretty exceptional way. I'm going to take a, a particular minute to introduce uh, the moderator for tonight and then I'm going to let Heather and Jane introduce themselves after that. Uh, we're really, really grateful to have Dr. Valerie Purdy Greenaway here as our moderator, a graduate of the college class of 1993 and a fellow women's basketball alumna. I will, I will shout out that for sure. Um, Valerie serves as the director of the Laboratory of Intergroup Relations and the Social Mind. She's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Columbia University, core faculty member for the Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholars Program, and a research fellow at the Institute for Research on African-American Studies at Columbia. I'm continuously blown away by this woman. Uh, it's a, uh, it's really just a, like a source of pride and emotion that I can count her as a, as a teammate and a, and a friend at this point. Um, but you know, don't get excited because you haven't yet heard from these other two who really give her a run for her money in the accomplishment uh, arena. So um, Heather, I'm gonna toss it to you first and, and ask you to quickly introduce yourself and, and Jane. Um, and once that's complete, Valerie, it's, it's yours, over to you. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Heather. I grew up in Connecticut and I graduated from Columbia in 2013 from the college. I played volleyball all four years and now I am the CEO of a startup company in the travel space. Hi, everyone. I'm Jane. I grew up in Fremont, California. Um, I was in the college. I graduated in 2014 with a degree in economics. Um, and I am now one of the co-founders of Frankly Apparel. Um, it's a braless clothing company. Well, thank you both Jane and Heather for being with us uh, this evening. I, I have to start off with a, with a little bit of a joke so you get my sense of humor, but this looks surprisingly similar to my 13-year-old's uh, gym class because it's been virtual all year. So part of me is like, we should just like rock this, some burpees and some, you know, just show all the uh, athletes out there how it's done. But um, given that it's late in the evening on the East Coast, we will not do that, but we could, and I might pull that out before before the evening's over. Um, so anyway, hope you all have shorts on uh, underneath your outfits. Anyway, it is uh, just a delight um, to, to be here. Um, Columbia for me is just, uh, it just keeps on uh, giving and giving in terms of opportunities to meet incredible um, um, women, scholars, athletes. Um, and now uh, all, both of you are, are sort of, you know, really just killing it in, in the business world. Um, the goal for, for tonight is just to offer uh, a window of your journey. Um, what is it like to be uh, a student athlete? What was your um, experience like? Um, how did athletics sort of shape your ability to um, sort of move to the next stage in terms of your um, career? We'd love to hear more about your, your journey. Both of you um, are, are sort of owners of your own company, and, and that puts you in a very, very small and a, an elite group uh, in terms of entrepreneurs, very, very rare. And we'd love to know, is there a relationship between 
between being a student athlete and, and that part of your journey. We'll talk a little bit about um, equity, both in sports and, and also uh, out there in the in the world of, of business. And, um, and you know, and, and we'll just sort of you know, share and, and go back and forth. So um, I'd like to start off with um, Jane, just because you're you're to my my left. Um, tell us tell us your story. Um, you know, maybe a little bit, but you know, how you went to, to Columbia, uh, a little bit about your your athletics career, and then and then help us to understand uh, uh, wh how you got to your your business today. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I am the daughter of two Chinese immigrants. Both of them um, showed up pretty much after they graduated college and knew nobody in the country. Um, and I started playing golf because my dad found out that a lot of women's golf scholarships go unused. He's like, oh, wow, like, you know, maybe this is it because you're tall, but you're not tall enough for some of the other sports. And so why don't we give this a try? And so, you know, I started playing seriously after a very subpar JV volleyball season um, <laughs> was very bad. Um, and so I realized I was like, you know, if I can actually be good at the sport, let's give it a try. And so, you know, we play catch up. A lot of people are committed to schools by the time they're like 15. I was still finishing last in my division um, when I was 15. So it's never too late. Um, but, you know, I was recruited by Columbia and it felt like a no brainer for me in a lot of ways. I was able to be both a student and an athlete. Um, I wasn't forced to only take online classes. Um, you know, I really was going to be able to balance that. And that's why I chose Columbia. Um, at Columbia, I followed the herd a little bit and um, went to Wall Street after graduating. Um, you know, I did an internship at a hedge fund. I, it was a new hedge fund. I cold called and emailed and got in there somehow. Um, interned twice at Goldman Sachs, one in equity capital markets and another internship in industrials investment banking. And I went back um, to industrials M&A basically afterward. Um, I quickly realized that finance wasn't really for me. I think there was a lot of you know, great parts of the job. You got a lot of opportunities you never would have gotten otherwise. But there was a lot of like, you know, painful things about the job too. And what I realized that I was that I actually wanted to be more in operations. I wanted to be more in the weeds, not just telling you, you know, if you guys buy this company, you guys will do great, like in terms of your earnings. Um, and so I joined Uber. Um, Uber was pretty big at that point in time. It was about 5,000 people. But I joined a team of 12 and we basically did whatever we could to make New Jersey run better. Um, and so, yeah, so we were basically like, you know, doing driver incentives, thinking about competition, all these different things. And so during my three years at Uber, um, the company tripled. And so I spent more time basically operating and more time basically doing things that, you know, people at big companies often do, which is explaining why you did something to somebody. Um, and so, you know, I left Uber at that point in time and went to business school. And at business school, I knew I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And so I ended up starting a um, bralis apparel company with one of my classmates. Wow. wow. And you didn't just go to any business school. <laughs> just like, oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I went to Stanford GSB. And so um, they don't really have like focuses there, but I took a lot of classes on entrepreneurship just because of the environment and also where we were. Um, and yeah, so I think we're, I think we're probably one of the very few non-tech startups in my class. Um, and we're really excited because there's still a lot of support for us. Um, and our classmates are very behind us and it's a great community. Well, we are going to, we're going to talk about all that. We're, we're going to talk about finance. We're going to talk about the uh, work culture. We're going to talk about braless apparel. We are going to talk about that this evening. Um, so, but let us turn to, to Heather. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Jane. Welcome, um, Heather. Uh, tell us your, tell us your story. Sure. Thanks, Valerie. Um, so I grew up in Connecticut. Um, and I was a competitive gymnast for 14 years. Wow. I'm six feet tall, by the way. So that oh, was wow. Okay. Fun. Wow. Um, and I didn't start playing volleyball until my freshman year of high school. Um, but I got recruited to play, um, volleyball in college and I chose Columbia because like what school is better than Columbia, right? Um, <laughs> of course. And it was one of the best decisions of my life. And so, um, I I joined the program, um, the volleyball program at Columbia wasn't at a great spot at the time. And by the time I graduated, um, we were second in the league. So that was definitely like a fight. Wanted to be number one, but almost got there. Um, I had an internship in college in venture capital. And so I got to see like a hybrid of both finance and entrepreneurship. And like Jane, I went um, into finance right after I graduated. So I joined 
Citigroup Investment Banking, um, and I was in their payments team. And then um, about a year later, I decided I wanted to go back to that, you know, early stage startup kind of vibes. And I joined a small startup company um, after, after City. So that company was called Vettery. It's a tech hiring marketplace. I joined as employee number four. So <laughs> very early stage. Wow. Um, and over the next four years, that company grew to 300 people. So crazy growth, wow. um, just like Jane saw too. And, uh, and I was head of operations. So I helped build and launch almost every initiative that brought them there. Um, that company got acquired. And after a year after the acquisition, decided that I wanted to leave with two other people that I had met there that I thought were also incredible. And the three of us co-founded um, a business in the travel sightseeing space in New York City. Um, we had sightseeing car tours in 1920s and 1930s vehicles, um, which was a wild, fun time. But obviously that didn't bode well when, co when COVID hit. So we used what we learned about the industry. We totally pivoted on a dime. And now we're the same team, just building software for the travel industry. That, that is amazing. And it seems like, although we have to be cautious, um, you know, success is, in terms of, of the travel is, is coming back. That, that's, that's, that seems to be the trajectory that, that it looks like. So There's a lot um, of good signs. Yes, a lot of, a lot of good signs. Um, well, this, this is just it, in, incredible. And I, I think what I'd like to do is sort of um, start with um, a, a very basic question, which is, you know, what is a student athlete? What does it mean to be a female student athlete at Columbia? Um, what is it like? And you know, maybe if you can also reflect on what lessons or or skills you were able to acquire, and you each of you have enough distance that you might be able to reflect on that. I think that people assume that being a student athlete means that you just go to class and you do your sports, but there is just so much more to that. So um, well, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Heather, and help us unpack that. What does it mean to be a student athlete? What did it mean to you? What was it like? Um, and, and maybe layer on top of that, what, what was it like to be a female uh, student athlete at Columbia? The one word that's just coming to mind right now is just the word commitment. Um, I think to be a student athlete, whether it's Columbia or anywhere, um, you have to make the commitment to yourself to be an athlete and to really commit yourself to the team and the people that are going to war every day with you on the court, um, but also make a commitment to be a student too, because you're, you're both at the same time. Um, and that commitment means that you have to make sacrifices like, um, and they're not all bad sacrifices, but you know, you, you have to have those priorities and, and those two things were my job. Um, and, and that just kept things in perspective, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, I loved it. Yes. Yes. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the, I think some of the, the, the benefits. What about you, Jane? Yeah. When I think about my experience as a student athlete, obviously you guys know golf is pretty lonely when you're actually playing out there. Um, but I think the word team for me is the biggest thing. Um, and so, you know, my relationship with my teammates, that was probably what got me through the entire um, you know, four years, because, you know, as you guys know, like, like Heather said, it's a lot of commitment, it's a lot of time, there's a lot of opportunity cost in terms of, you know, should I go do this other club, should I go spend more time studying, should I, like, write this paper for the 15th time instead of the 10th time, um, and so, you know, having your teammates be there to support you and understand what you're going through um, is probably one of the biggest things that I've taken away, and I think for me also, those relationships, even post-school, are what has held up. Um, you know, I like regularly talk to a lot of people from both athletics and especially my team. Um, and when I think about like, you know, my time, it's yes, some of it was on the golf course, a lot of it was in class, a lot of it was, you know, sitting in a library, etc. But I think the like most joyful memories from that piece of it is with my team. Um, and you asked like, you know, what did you learn from being a student athlete? I think, you know, you have like kind of the more obvious things in terms of prioritization and balancing and like that commitment, knowing like most of the things you want to do that are worth doing will hurt a little bit in some way or shape or form. Um, but I think for me, a lot of it was also learning how to deal with eight different personalities. Like we were always traveling together. We're always in a van. Yes. Um, you know, figuring that piece out was actually really like critical for me down the line too. 
What what if that's a that's a great segue? What what about um, you, Heather? In terms of you know what what was sort of something that you uh, learned? I think commitment is a powerful powerful component. What what else? Oh gosh, there's there's so much. So that's a loaded question. I'll just I'll kind of spurt off what's on my mind right now, <laughs> right now. Um, but I would say number number one, um, you know, c dedicating yourself to something it changes you when you when you really dedicate yourself and you really go after that goal. You're not just like oh let's get a ring. You're like this is what I wake up for every day and every choice I make is going to go for this. And that changes you, it has to. And it's, it's at a different level than it was in high school. Um, for me, I grew up playing an individual sport, gymnastics. Um, and so, you know, through, through the sport of volleyball, I learned how, even if I was at my best, if I wasn't making the people around me shine just as bright, it just didn't matter. And that was a hard lesson to learn coming from somebody who just, you know, you put the time in, you put the effort in, and then you get rewarded for it. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was at a different, a different level. So, um, and then what Jane, what you just said kind of made me think it's not just working with other people on a team. It's working with other people from different backgrounds, like growing up, every sport I played was with people in my community. Um, and so coming to Columbia where everybody has a different story, has a different background, comes from a different experience. Um, learning to understand where they're coming from and then learning to work with them through that experience um, was also not, not necessarily like um, difficult to do, but it definitely took an adjustment because I didn't, I didn't expect to experience that. That is so interesting. And, and I have a different vantage point because now I have a, a, a 13 year old. Uh, I also have a, 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 a 23 year old and an and a, a older son from our, our blended marriage. And, and I, I think literally every day, how do you build uh, a female athlete? Like what, 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 what goes into it? And, um, you know, thinking about it from a generational standpoint, it's, you know, the will to win you know, that, that you just want to win. And I am not aware of any other, um, uh, may, maybe you can get this in, in, in music or an orchestra or being in a play, but just that, that you, you want to win more than anything else. And I, I, it's hard for me to think about what other experiences you can put into a child that will, that will sort of g give you that, that experience. And I would argue that it translates to the, to the work world, but, but, but we'll get there. Um, um, before we sort of translate to, to talk about the, 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 the work world, who, who maybe we'll, we'll go back to, to Jane, um, who influenced you, whether it was, um, you know, other uh, women at Columbia, other men at Columbia, just other individuals, can, can you uh, tell us a story, maybe one or two people that um, really uh, uh, were a big influence on you during your time at Columbia? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I don't like we were on pre call and we were talking a little bit about like, you know, talking about equity in sports and like, you know, getting jobs like, you know, after Columbia. And I will say one of the people that had the biggest influence on me was my coach. My coach was known as kind of the scary coach, um, but she was always fair. Um, and so, you know, I think that's something that I've carried with me in terms of like trying to be like fair in terms of the way that we, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean just like fully equal distribution of time and resources and everything. Like we, she thought a lot about equity and like how to make things actually fair among the team. Um, but one of the things that I think she did incredibly well was figuring out how to use resources. And so it wasn't just golf alone. Um, she actually was very good at leveraging like alumni and coaches and everybody else from other parts of athletics um, to help place us and like help us with our jobs. And so I think a lot, a lot of honestly, like, you know, where I ended up, like in terms of the bank, et cetera, is largely due to her really thinking through, like, I think you should talk to this person. They did not play golf, but, you know, I have built a relationship with them. And like, you know, this, these are the people you should also leverage in terms of this part of it. And so, you know, she had a huge influence on me, not only personally, but I think in terms of my professional career, she also wrote one of my recs for um, Stanford because um, I was a deferred applicant. I applied when I was still in college. It was one of those two plus two programs. And so she had like written about like who I am as a person, et cetera. And I think a large part of why I got in was partly because of her recommendation. Oh, oh that's wonderful. That's what, thank you so much. Uh, what about you, Heather? Um, there's a few and I would say number one, um, 
just the, the people that I had played with, um, I just looked up to a really good example of that and a tangible one of how she impacted my career is I was, I was a freshman when she was a senior, her name's um, Ellie and she just had a baby actually. So, um, but she, when she graduated, she went um, and worked at City. And so when she knew that I was interested in pursuing finance, um, she introduced me to the right people, set me, set me up with conversations. Um, and I definitely had to work for it. I majored in sustainable development. I didn't say that earlier. So I didn't have like the traditional background that you would need to get into these, you know, interviews, but it made me, it made me practice for them even harder. Right. Um, but I think a lot of times people expect, you know, when you say, oh, who do you look up to? You're expecting to say, oh, this, you know, very senior person at this, in this very senior place. But I think a lot of times if, you know, you just kind of look out for the people around you, um, you can find inspiration from anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, you know, the, the, there's, uh, as a psychologist, I, I, I know about the power of, of social networks, both in terms of social capital and resources, but also in terms of, of, of inspiration. And, and I, I think that kind of leads me to um, my, my next question. And uh, I'm curious if you have any sort of uh, linkages between being um, a female athlete and how it sort of prepared you for uh, life after um, you left sports. Um, and uh, well, we never leave sports, but as you transitioned into the work world. Um, and I, I ask that because, you know, um, all these different uh, campaigns, you know, Nike, um, Tampax, the whole, you know, if you let me play, you know, the, the, the power of, of sports um, has been um, pretty sort of clearly um, documented in terms of it, it's, it's good for you, but we still don't know, like, what are the exact, you know, mechanisms? Like, what, what are the, and in, in other words, sort of what are the, the ideas or lessons or, or concepts that you, that you found translated when you, you moved into either graduate school or you moved into um, the, the work world that, that you can sort of um, reflect back on? I'm going to, I'm going to start. Um, and this might be an unpopular opinion, but I never saw myself as a female athlete. I always just saw myself yeah. as an athlete. Yeah. And I'm always torn because like there's pros and cons to identifying in certain ways, but at the end of the day, I just prefer to say for my own self, this benefits me. And I know that I'm more motivated when I know that like I have to prove myself every day, regardless of who I am or what my background mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's that's so powerful. And and you felt like you that translated and, and helped you in the next phase of your career. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. How how could it not? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah especially yeah. going into something like investment banking. Jane can speak to that too. Um, there were women all around me, but way more men. And so there were a lot of times when I was the only woman in the room, there were a lot of times that I was blatant, there was blatant, um, not, not even sexism, just her sexual harassment. Um, and you just like, I think what sport did is it just made me, it didn't phase me. It's just like, okay, that can happen. And that's outside of me. And I can't let that stop me because I have this goal. And I've been working every day for it. And if I let that phase me, um, then I'm not going to hit that goal. And so is that going to serve me? Yeah. yeah. And, and I just want to, you know, I just, you know, I want to sort of thank you for, for acknowledging, you know, one of the things I study is, is identity and, you know, people identify in a, in a variety of different ways. I think I, I sort of, I, I probably share, share uh, uh, more in common in, with you in the sense that I also saw myself as a, as an athlete. And I'm like, well, you, you know, it's axiomatic. I am a woman, but you know, you sort of, I sort of saw, saw myself as an athlete and it, it really wasn't only later when I looked back and said, I have a set of experiences that that come from being a, a woman basketball player that had I not been a basketball player, I, I wouldn't have had those, but I never really saw myself that, that way. Um, so that's really interesting. What, what about you, Jane? I think it's fascinating to hear that from both of you guys. Because I think from a pretty early age, I was fairly acutely aware of like, oh, like the way that people talk to me or the way that things are set up, but like a lot of it does have to do with, you know, how I identify. Like, for example, like very early on, like with golf, they always 
made the ladies play last. So like if you were in Texas, right? The men got all the 8 a.m. tea times. We got the 1 p.m. tea times. It is boiling hot on 1 p.m. They had an ambulance. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, and, but like it never switched. And there was this perception that women played slowly. Um, even though when you timed the rounds, like oh, in reality, that actually wasn't really true. And so, you know, I think for me, like that is something that I am pretty aware of. I think also partly, you know, I am also pretty aware of like, you know, I am an Asian American female golfer. Like when I think about who I am, um, I am very grateful for golf in terms of it gives me something to say to people who do not have the same life experience as me. I think it helped me immensely in my job when I had no idea what to talk about. I'd be like, oh, I played this course and it would really break the ice with some people yes. because like sports is a huge connector and yes. it really helps bridge a lot of gaps in terms of like, you know, maybe like, you know, I grew up and we weren't able to afford a country club membership. I did not grow up playing like, you know, like the best course all the time. Like my dad drove me a really long way to make sure I could put on good greens. And so, you know, I knew that was linked to like my parents being immigrants, um, you know, my experience. And so, you know, I'm very grateful for my sport in terms of giving me a bridge. Um, and I think for me, when I think about, you know, sports as a whole, I think like there are some sports that definitely have done a better job at not making people aware of like, you know, like, oh, are you a female? You know, do you identify as X? Like, you know, like, what is your race? Like, et cetera. Um, but, you know, as we know, golf is extremely like white and very male still. And so I think the nature of my sport also like really caused me to be hyper conscious of like who I was even from my high school years. That that is so I mean that that is so interesting and there's, there's all kinds of um interesting research on on social comparison you know your identity becomes more salient as a function of other people you know uh, around you but but also at at the same time I mean I I've had the same um experience, you know, I, I get really frustrated. Um, I talk to a lot of different companies and businesses around the sort of science of diversity and inclusion. And one of the things they talk about related to advancing the experiences of women in the professional world, and we'll talk about this in a minute, is they're saying they're like, oh, you should, um, you know, get to learn a sport so that you have something to talk about to create social glue. And, you know, there's even, you know, books like, you know, football for dummies and golf for, for dummies. And sorry, Heather, I haven't seen a volleyball. Uh, I haven't seen volleyball for dummies. Um, but the idea is that if you can just like learn a few terms, then maybe you will have this, this social glue. And I almost see it as sort of disrespectful to all of the things it takes to be um, an, an athlete. And, you know, the social glue is in the nuance, right? It's, it's which course, it's which, uh, you know, are you using the word, you know, your golf sticks instead of clubs, you know, it's all in the nuance. It's not, you know, it's, it, it's not something that you can just sort of read in a book and, and create uh, social glue. And then there's also the psychology that comes with it, right? And then there's also the network that, that, that comes with it. So there's just, there's so much more that you can't just, you know, get in a book. Um, so, you know, I, you know, uh, Heather, you, you touched on uh, a, a topic that um, while, while difficult is something that I think, uh, uh, I know I've experienced, you know, many, many of us that are on the line have experienced related to um, sexual harassment, uh, power dynamics, um, you know, Jane, even just talking about the, the difference between, you know, golfing at, at you know, 1 p.m. versus, you know, an, an early morning tea time. Can either of you, um, talk a little bit about your time as an athlete and then we'll, we'll sort of transition to the to the to the work world um did you what are some of the um uh, maybe baked in inequities that you think still need to change in terms of of women's um sports and what did you see how did you um overcome it but also what would you like to see change uh, maybe uh, let's go with Heather. Ooh, that's hard. Um, I am a professor. <laughs> I am a sleep deprived professor. So I like to ask hard questions. Yeah, I would say probably the thing that I just remember most uh, readily was um, like locker room space. I know it seems yeah. so kind of futile now, but um, it's for, I'll give you an example and I'm not trying to complain. It's just a concrete. That's how I saw it when I was in college. And I haven't thought about it since you, until you just asked me right now. Um, but down, I understand Levy and Jim has not a lot of space. <laughs> um, but yet 
the basketball team had two locker rooms, one with a TV and chairs and one where they actually had their lockers. And we shared a, a room half the size with the fencing team. Yes. And it was always awkward because like my locker was kind of shared with another team and we were in half the space of one of their rooms. And it just, it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. That was why I was there since then. I know the coaches of the volleyball program advocated for us. And now I think the volleyball team has their own dedicated space. It's still the same space, but they revamped the locker room. I know they poured a lot of resources into that. And so I can't, I'm not like complaining, but it's yeah. definitely something I saw and I didn't really understand how, how that got by or how that was explained. Yeah. And, and, you know, so you, you, you know, also someone made that decision, right? Someone, yeah. there were decisions that were made that, that went into that. I remember when Levy Gym was built, right? So decisions are made like, oh, we'll combine this. Somebody amount. thought that was okay. And someone then thought that that was okay. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Not a complaint, just a fact on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. What about you, Jane? Um, actually, Heather, that's not stupid at all because like we, saw what happened with the NCAA, right? Like in terms of the tournament for the men and women. Um, and like, you know, there's all these arguments about like revenue and all these people are talking about that, but it doesn't negate the fact that equality in terms of, and like equity in terms of this piece is important in terms of like resources and space. Um, I think for me, one of the biggest things that was structural was that the men's team had existed for a lot longer. Columbia women's golf, I believe the first class was something like 07. Like there wasn't actually a women's team up until that There used point. to be a club team. Yeah, exactly. And so like having a actual D1 women's team, still fairly new. And so when you think about the resources and people who want to help their own, you know, like in terms of that piece of it, the men always kind of had a home course. We were a little bit of like a traveling circus for a while. Um, and we eventually got a home course. I believe it was my sophomore year. Um, and it was an amazing course, um, but it wasn't also like at that point in time, we, it wasn't exactly like home, like, cause the men had been at their course for a really long yes. time. Yes. We just showed up to this new course. All the members were still getting used to our presence. There are a lot of like, you know, rules and restrictions in terms of when we could or could not play. I'm sure the men actually had that too. Um, but, you know, I think just the fact that we were homeless for so long in terms of like that course and like practicing at random places who would let us be there, like it felt like we were, we like were like really wanting to be there versus they were like tolerating us in a way. Yes, yes. And so that piece of it felt difficult at the time and it felt very gendered and I understood like, okay, yeah, like there are a lot more alums who have gone through this men's golf pro program they're willing to put in a lot more for their team. Um, but I think this is a difference once again, between like equity and equality, right? Like in terms of like, just because we've been around a little bit shorter, doesn't like to get us to the same place means that there might need to be more put into us um, as a team. Yeah. And I yeah. think that feeling for a long time had lingered with me in terms of like things not exactly being. And what Jane is describing actually motivated me to want to become part of the Women's Leadership Council because, because we didn't have the same kind of network that some of the other teams, even women's basketball, it's not just a man-woman thing. It's just like the, the strength of the alum of a program. Um, and I, I said, well, if, if I don't see like huge numbers coming back from my sport to support the experience that I had, I can be that for somebody else down the road. So that's why that's yeah. really important to me. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I, you know, what often, you know, a lot of times sports boils down to is people's perceptions that it's individual grit and determination. And what people don't see is, you know, well, it takes you twice as long to get dressed when you're sharing a locker room with someone who's fencing and you're moving their stuff aside, or you have to do this or that, or you're moving to a, a sort of a home course that doesn't feel like home. Like all of those little things go into building a women's powerful women's program. And so I, I, I think that oftentimes people think about, oh, it's it's just a hotel room. You know, when I was in school, it's like, 
oh, it's just a weight room. Like, oh, it's just a, but, but, but we think about, the, uh, about, you know, what does it take to win uh, women winning and men women, win, well, men and women winning doesn't look any different, right? It still is the same, but sometimes you need to build different resources to, to make it happen. And to me, it's very much a microcosm of, of sort of broader society, right? Which is, which is where I, I'd like to, to, to transition to. And, you know, what, what I'd love to hear, you know, we, we have about, you know, 25 minutes uh, left. And I, I would love to maybe pivot to hear more about your, your companies. You know, what is it that you um, are doing um, right now? Um, and what is it that sort of gave you um, the ability to sort of, you know, uh, being a, a, an entrepreneur is rare, being a female entrepreneur is even more rare. And then, you know, connecting it up to potentially sports and determination, it, you know, puts you really in a, in a small um, minority. So maybe we'll sort of um, start with, with Jane. Tell us about your company um, now, like the story of like how, how you got it started. Um, and, and if you see a link back to sports, that's great. If you don't, that's fine. Yeah, for sure. Um, so um, frankly, makes bras clothing. Um, basically, we wanted to question this notion that, you know, every morning a woman needs to wake up and put on her bra. Um, you know, that is something that has been ingrained in us. And I understand that, you know, women with larger chests generally need the support, et cetera. But why does it need to be something that doesn't necessarily work great, even for women with larger chests? So my co-founder is actually um, an F cup. And so she has talked about, you know, her bras preventing her from wearing what she wants, fashion not designing for her. And so what we really wanted to do was make the bralis trend um, more accessible to more cup sizes. Um, and we felt pretty strongly about this. And so, you know, we started working on this in a class in September of 2019. Wow. Um, and so it was in the beginning, it was just us like kind of piecing things together. Um, but, you know, as time went on, it became more and more real. Our professors were like, you know, this feels very obvious to me. We go after this. And then COVID happened. Um, and we were both sitting there like, are we supposed to go get jobs? Like, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> like, it's gonna work. Um, and so, you know, a couple months in, we were actually like, actually, you know, people are at home, a lot less people are wearing bras. If they are wearing bras or wearing bralettes or more comfortable alternatives. Um, and so we decided to take the plunge. And I think for me, a lot of this is part of like, you know, like my mentality with golf and everything, it's, you know, controlling what you can and not control like not trying to control what you can't like you know once you hit the ball it's out there like you know whatever happens happens like you might you know have a bird come and like eat the ball like I don't know like gators have gone after my golf ball before like you just don't know what's going to happen and so for me I always thought about it like okay at the end of the day am I going to regret you know what am I going to regret more am I going to regret not going after this company or am I going to regret not taking this full-time job offer and for me over and over again, it was, I will always regret it if I don't throw a hundred percent at this. And like, that is also generally my mentality in sports too. Like when I think about, you know, just how I approach golf and like anything else that I go after. Um, and so, yeah, so we're really excited. We are launching in May. We basically continued on despite um, a lot of issues with COVID and manufacturing thrown our way. And I'm sure Heather can talk more about this, but you know, fundraising, um, it's a whole different beast also, you know, not a ton of women raise money for their ventures. A lot of times you either have to bootstrap or figure it out. Um, and I think for us, um, the fundraising part really showed us like how difficult it can be without the network, without a lot of the privileges that I have. Um, you know, I think it's difficult for a woman to fundraise for a woman of color, like especially black women, it's even more difficult to fundraise um, for your business and for your idea. You need a lot more traction to get the same kind of looks. Um, and so, you know, having that perseverance and dedication to keep going, actually Heather was the one who told me about this. She said she listened to the Peloton founders, how I built this every time she was frustrated um, with, um, with fundraising. And actually I started doing that too, because this man got thousands of no's. I only got in the, you know, double digits, like 40 something no's. And uh, so I felt a lot better. Okay, <laughs> you're gonna tell us about this. You're gonna tell us about this, Heather. 
So, yeah. and I, I, I want to, so that, that is, a, is amazing. And I want to hear more sort of specifically wh where you're at in terms of fundraising, because there are lots of uh, alumni out there and no woman wants to wear a bra anymore. So this is going to be a multi-million dollar business that has been proven at home. Um, so, uh, but, but what I will say is that um, there's uh, interesting research. Some of it uh, came right out of Columbia University showing that even in terms of venture pitches, the kinds of questions that people ask are gendered. So um, women are often asked about a uh, risk and sort of to, to talk about what the problems are that they have to overcome. And men are often talked about uh, in terms of promise, like sort of, and, and so the nature of the question actually shapes your ability to, to sort of talk about promise versus talk about risk. And of course that predicts the amount of fundraising that you get. So you see these things, you know, all, all along the way. And it, it takes sort of determination and, and grit and intelligence and operations and all those on, and networks. But it also takes a reimagination of the, the business world to, to create um, equity and, and a fair shot. Because by the time uh, women have launched their own company, there's just so many more barriers that they've had to overcome. Yeah. What about what about you, Heather? Tell us about your 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 company, um, sort of the origins and and I guess in in the time of COVID, sort of how you've had to pivot and, and where you are today. I have like two company stories to share, even though it's all been part of the same journey. Yeah. Um, but I started a sightseeing tour company because I thought that the way that tourists were experiencing the city that I loved was just really stale. Um, and so I came up with this. You roaring... mean you don't want to sit on a red apple bus? <laughs> it, it, it was yeah. awful. I mean, At 1 p.m. in the heat? What? <laughs> so I, um, I got some cars from the 1920s and 30s. I developed a script. I did a lot of research behind it. I hired some incredible tour guides and we just started testing the idea out. Um, and it sounds way more fun and lighthearted than it is in practice, because when you have a fleet of 12 vehicles all under the, under the year of 1934, mm. um, riding through New York City seven days a week, holidays, weekends, everything, you can imagine that that's not always the most pleasant experience, um, especially because our busy days as a tourism company were on the days when you would traditionally think of having off like Christmas and weekends and all that kind of stuff. And yes. so, yes. Um, and the types of problems, like I had come from a tech startup company at Vettery. And so I started this business um, with nowadays, it would be called it. And the types of problems and operational issues we ran into were a lot more tangible than they were sitting behind a computer, running into a bug or running into somebody who couldn't access something online, right? And so it always felt heavier. And so what I experienced with nowadays was just, it felt like waking up every day, getting punched in the face, going to bed, waking up every day, getting punched every day. Um, and it was really hard, but um, again, I, I think it go goes back to my experience in volleyball where even if you lose the first two games, the way volleyball works is you have to win best out of five. You have to come back swinging because there's, there's a shot. And the game's not over till it's over. And I was like, these investors have given me resources and I cannot quit. I, I will not let them down. I can't just fold. I have to just keep making this work. Wow. That got really hard with COVID when not only did people stop booking, but in the masses, people were asking for refunds. And so we were bleeding out cash. And the question was, what do we do? Do we just give whatever remaining we have back to the investors and say, sorry, it didn't work out. We had learned a lot about the industry and how it works, like the, how travel wholesalers work and how there's this whole network of people in the industry who buy and sell travel. And most people don't know that it exists. And we knew about it because we were living in it. Mm -hmm. And we saw how inefficient all their systems were. And we said, do you know what? There's a chance with the remaining resources that we have, we can actually be really um, good stewards of this money. If we build a software, you know, platform, it'll be a lot cheaper to do that than, than run cars through New York city. And so, um, we developed a plan. We talked to the, our potential users. I, um, hired some more engineers. And then I went to my investors and I said, here's the idea. We think that there's something really here. If you believe that there is, we would like to make this pivot, like with your blessing. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that was hard too, to just completely abandon, um, you know, a, a business that I spent a, a, over a year building, but it was the right move because we couldn't quit. Waiting wasn't an option because COVID was bigger than anybody could have imagined. Um, and we just had to make the best decision we could. So what, tell us a little bit about this platform. So if you can, I don't know if it's in the, what, what's Yeah, the so um, it's not meant for consumers. I so see. it's not something that you would understand of like, oh, I went to TripAdvisor and I bought, you know, this all-inclusive trip. It's not like that. Um, there's an entire network, mostly in group travel, international travel, um, but also like if you buy a, an itinerary off of anywhere, that itinerary has been packaged by somebody and probably not just one person. It's probably passed through like three or four hands. Interesting. And the industry is huge um, for travel, reselling and wholesaling. Um, and the way that they do business and they, the way that they contract with suppliers and restaurants and hotels, it's all being done on Excel on folders on people's desktops and in binders. And so interesting. Build a work system for that. I see. So it's like an infrastructure. I, you know, the two of you are <laughs> the two of you are sort of, you know, on the screen side by side. And I'm thinking to myself, travel with braless apparel, what could be better? <laughs> I'm imagining different lines. <laughs> we can have an off uh, an offline conversation. I see a blending here, um, but 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 no. You know, one of the things that that I, I there's so many d directions that that I want to go, but but I, I do want to want to sort of in integrate this um, because you know you may not think about yourselves as as sort of leaders in this space, but you very much are, and. Um, you know the, the the death of 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 George Floyd has really led to this you know racial uh, reckoning a whole new sort of you know civil rights movement but also it has elevated um, before that the sort of hashtag um, Me Too movement uh, out of such incredible tragedy comes these ideas around diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And there has been so much energy, even during the pandemic, around um, you know, elevating the experiences of women, elevating the experiences of women of color, um, really thinking about equitable um, structures, um, you know, companies donating money, uh, revenue, thinking about you know, training, from both of your perspectives, maybe I'll, I'll flip back to, to Heather to start. Um, what do you think is needed in the space of uh, corporations and business to not only just elevate women, not only just to make sure that there's sort of parity with men, but, but really to ensure that uh, women entrepreneurs are thriving or that companies are sort of removing um, all of the, the barriers that create the incredible equity, whether inequity, whether it's related to pay, promotions, uh, succession in terms of, of businesses, all of those, uh, all of those things. What, what do companies really need to be doing right now from, from your vantage point? Yeah, I don't think I have the answer to that. Um, I think it's really hard. And um, when it comes to some of these issues, I think it's just really important for not only the companies to take a stand publicly, um, but I think it has to go deeper than that. I think, I think it really comes down to the individuals within the companies, like actually making a difference. I'll give you an example of somebody that made a difference in my life. Like I had a mentor that I had found um, in my internship in BC when I was in college and I had kept in touch with him. And I was negotiating my compensation when I left banking to go to the startup world. I just thought I'd reach out to him. And he gave me the advice. He said, Heather, if you are not uncomfortable with the number you're asking for, you're not asking for enough. Because mm -hmm. I teach that in my negotiations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Get good and uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. yes. it's like if, if you feel good about that number, you need to raise the number. And so he didn't have to tell me that, but I knew that what he was saying was true for men, women, every, everybody, everybody has to be uncomfortable with the number they ask for. And even just getting that advice from him was like having an ally on the other side. And it doesn't have to come from a woman. It just, it just has to be in recognizing that there is a dis disadvantage, whether you're a woman, whether you're of a different race or a different 
um, anything, right? Any, any kind of background, just recognizing that your experience is different from that person's experience. And what, what can you do to level the playing field? How can you reach out and how can companies make a difference? I don't know the answer at a company perspective. I've only seen it on an individual perspective, but if a company does it right, I definitely want to like study that and and implement that. Well, listen, I don't think that you could have came up with a better answer because, you know, you can put all the structures in place, but what it really comes down to is individual relationships. So, so, you know, and, and, and companies are really trying to think about this in terms of sponsorship and mentorship, but, you know, it's about people stepping up. So, so I think you had a great, great answer. And I'll see if, if Jane, maybe you have a a different uh, vantage point to the, to the, to the question, but, you know, there are many people on this, uh, call that are, are, you know, maybe we can give them some, some solutions. Like what, what is it that companies need to be doing, or even what is it that individuals need to be doing not to just elevate the voices of women, but really to, to like remove um, the barriers, whether it's in entre- entrepreneurship or, or in businesses more general. Yeah. Um, I think about this in two different ways. I think when I look at large companies, one, I want to see the data. What does your work- workforce look like? What does management look like? you know, what is your, like, you know, lowest level look like? How are people being compensated? Like, basically, like, show me the data because we can't do anything. We can be like, oh, there are enough, like, oh, maybe we need a little bit more, et cetera. Um, I can tell you that, like, people hate this, but the mandates being, like, the next person you must hire, like, hire, you must interview a woman, and, like, that actually does work. Um, My manager in India um, a long time ago, For my role back in the day, they didn't hire women because we weren't quantitative enough. Um, And so that uh, she basically was like, I'm not hiring anybody until you guys bring me a female candidate, like until you guys bring me viable female candidates. And everybody was like, that's not going to work, et cetera. It worked. That's, we can't do that. <laughs> she, like, she had a great tenure at the company, like, you know, and from then on, they hired women for that position. But for a long time, um, they, you know, really didn't do that. And so, you know, I think a lot of it is putting your money where your mouth is. I think it's always hard for me when a company like, you know, is like, yeah, we stand behind, you know, the family of George Floyd, et cetera. And then I look at your board and there's not a single person of color. There's not a single woman on there. And that is always very hard for me to stomach. Um, It is difficult. I don't believe in the pipeline problem. I think for us as founders, we have a responsibility in terms of how and how we build our culture. Like, so when Heather and I are thinking about our next employee, um, we want to be very conscious about building a diverse um, workforce and a group of people because we believe that'll give us the best outcome. That'll help you avoid the Pepsi fiasco with like Kendall Jenner and all that kind of situation because no one at that table spoke up. My hunch is that there weren't many, you know, POC, like, you know, people like just general, like, you know, non cis white men possibly at that table. Um, and so, you know, for us, we really believe that having that diversity is going to make us a better company, especially as a fashion company that is trying to be more inclusive, like that has to be in our DNA and how we think about almost everything from the models we use to what language we use. Um, you know, I think we, like me and Heather, like my co-founder feel a very strong responsibility in terms of the company we build. Um, and we want to make sure like, you know, we're not going to be perfect, but we want to make sure that we are putting our best foot forward in terms of building the best workplace for people to bring their whole selves to work. That, that's just, uh, that's just amazing. And, and I think in, in, in my own space, I, I sort of have, have, have learned, experienced, uh, try to build a lab where, where I see, uh, the, the science that underlies, you know, elevating the experiences of, of all kinds of diverse groups as, as sort of my, my own uh, form of, of, of social justice. I mean, you know, there, there's nothing like um, coming with the, the best, you know, evidence that you can sort of come with to, to help people think through these, these really, um, really difficult problems. Um, well, we are, uh, we have just have a, a few more minutes. So I want to start, um, you know, moving toward, towards um, wrapping up. And, you know, I, I oftentimes people say, you know, oh, you know, you're, you're a, a, a role model. I, I'm not even sure what, what that actually means. You just try to live your life and, 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 and hope you're doing, doing good things. But there are many um, young people um, uh, on, on this, this call. There, there's also um, sort of, you know, older people who maybe have lost their way in terms of, of sports. And so um, I, I'd like to, to sort of 
uh, uh, ask you, you know, to, to both of you to, to sort of re reflect on um, both looking back and looking forward, but we'll start when looking back. When you think about sort of the next generation of, of athletes, uh, the next generation of, of women athletes, you know, transgender athletes, you know, when we think about the next generation of, of athletes, um, what are the things that you think, like one or two things you think that they could be doing during their time at Columbia to sort of put them in a position to um, follow what their dreams are. It may not be um, finance, it may be something else, but, but what are the things that when you look back that Columbia can, can do if you hook into it when you're a student athlete at the time? Um, let's see, we'll go with Heather. Yeah, I think it's, it all comes down to relationships and investing in those relationships, not just your teammates, but the, but the systems that are in place to, you know, bring you to the goals that you want. Like I very heavily used the student development, um, or what, what was it called? Like the career development? Yes. Career development. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Like I too. had my, my resume read like a hundred times there. I, and I went to almost every panel. Um, I, I just, I got connected because that was an experience that was offered to me. Um, it would be really easy to be like, I'm tired. I worked out for five hours today. I had six hours of classes today. I want to go to sleep, but that was an experience. And I just wanted to be there to say yes and to do it. And investing in relationships started, I guess, in college, but then even, even in, um, you know, post-college every, every time I met somebody that I was inspired by, I just clung to them. So the founders of the first startup that I ever joined are investors in my company now. Wow. The, the, two, the two people that I admired most that I worked alongside with at Vettery are now my two co-founders. Like you just pull people along because you can't do it on your own. Don't expect to. You have to use the resources and the people around you. Wow. That's amazing. That That's amazing. And, and it is so incredibly hard to do that during the pandemic, but also Columbia has been working so incredibly hard to keep those networks um, available. So yeah, that's amazing. Um, what about you, uh, Jane? Yeah, I think in terms of things you can do now, um, I think this is something that I'm obviously still working on also, um, but don't be afraid to ask because you know if they say no, you're still at the same place. <laughs> Um, and I still have like, you know, it's still not the easiest for me. I think like some of it might just be because how like my family is like, I don't have the easiest time asking for things. Um, but I think feel, you know, you're a student, you can have a little bit of audacity, like, honestly, like in terms of who you reach out to, like, you know, you're forgiven because you're a student. That's and, so true. <laughs> yeah, and, like at Stanford again, like, you know, we used our at dot edu email addresses because so many people are happy to respond to a student. And so, you know, if you want to learn something, if you want to know something, even if it is like, you know, wildly out there, you don't know what could be useful down the line. Like, you know, there's always that story about Steve Jobs and calligraphy, right? Like, you know, had nothing to do with anything, but that's why we have fonts. Like, I think don't be afraid to reach out to people you admire, like Heather said, um, and like, you know, latch onto those people and don't let go and keep those relationships. I think that is something that's super smart. Um, but also, yeah, don't be afraid to explore, like, you know, I still sometimes wish I took more of some of, like, more random classes outside of my major, um, and spent more time doing things that I probably might have enjoyed a little bit more. Um, and so I think all those things, like, are opportunities and things that you might not get again unless you go to grad school, and so, like, hang on to it. And, like, also within athletics, same thing, like, just because someone played a different sport doesn't mean that they didn't have a similar experience. Um, you know, you guys have a lot more shared experience than you think. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. And so my last question is your sports life today. Tell us about your, your, your sports life today and, 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 and does it sort of keep you going in, in, in any way? What, what can you help uh, uh, those of us that are moving into stages where we're long, long away from, from, from sports? Um, does sports continue to uh, arrest you, captivate you? Do you still, what, what does your sports life look like today? Yeah, I kind of had a weird uh, second sport situation. I am now an amateur boxer. Uh, and so that is basically what I spent. All right. Um, COVID is a little bit stopping me from doing that. There's no sparring really. Like 
some of my friends are still going to national because that's actually happening apparently. Um, but for me, like it's been opposite of golf and it's been a huge challenge and um, I've loved having something to work towards. Um, but other than that, you know, um, I love watching sports. I, it helps me still once again connect with uh, people that I might not normally hang out with. At the GSB, uh, I played a lot of golf um, and met a lot of people I may not have hung out with otherwise. Awesome. And what about you, Heather? Tell us about yeah, your sports there, life. There, I went through a phase where I was taking tennis lessons. I went through a phase where I was doing kickboxing before, like right before the pandemic. Um, but actually now I'm six months pregnant. So I'm just trying to stay active every day. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Um, you too will have the joy of sleepless nights and trying to exercise. <laughs> well, just trying to get some movement in, you know? Wonderful. Well, you know, I, I've trans transferred my basketball to triathlons, to cycling. And, you know, what I will say is that the energy, the friendships, the connections from Columbia and from sports uh, really do last, last a lifetime. So with that, I want to say thank you so much, um, Jane, to Heather, ask Stay connected. For those of you that are that are out there, um, if you're looking for incredible ways to invest in new and creative, incredible women, there are two right in front of us. So um, thank you so much. All stay safe. And Emily, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you all so much. As somebody who has literally been sitting on the edge of my seat this whole time, I just want to thank you all so much for your time. I think, you know, we planned this talk to fall in Women's History Month. Um, and I think with that comes a sense of inspiration, but I think after hearing your stories, your journeys, these little nuggets of advice that you all have left us with um, will provide us with even more inspiration. Um, so thank you guys again so much for joining us. And we are hoping to have many more of these conversations in the future. So everybody who has tuned in, please keep your eyes out for more wonderful highlights of all of our wonderful alums. And thank you guys all again. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, guys.